Side Tune, page 194, Saturday, September 17th. You go had forbidden her to watch TV or get on the internet, but Kathy couldn't resist. She searched for her husband's name. She searched for their address, their company. She searched for any sign that her husband had been found. She found nothing about him, but found other terrible things all over the web. She found news of the violence and evidence of its overstatement. One page would report hundreds of murders, crocodiles in the water, gangs of men rampaging. Another page would report that no babies had been raped that there had been no murders in the Superdome, no deaths in the convention center. There was no end to the fear and confusion, the racist assumption and the rumor mongering. No one debated the city was in chaos, but now there was debate over where the chaos had originated. Was it the residents or was it those sent to bring order? Kathy's mind spun as she read about the unprecedented concentration of armed men and women in the city. First, she read about the mercenaries. Immediately after the storm, wealthy business and individuals had called in private security firms from all over the world. At least five different organizations had sent soldiers for hire into the city, including Israeli mercenaries from a firm called Instinctive Shooting International. Kathy took in a quick breath. Israeli commandos in New Orleans? That was it, she realized. Her husband was an Arab, and there were Israeli preliminaries on the ground in the city. She leapt to conclusions. And the Blackwater Soldiers, Blackwater USA, a private security firm that employed former soldiers from the U.S. and elsewhere, has sent hundreds of personnel to the region. They were there in an official capacity hired by the Department of Homeland Security to help maintain order. They arrived in full battle dress. Some carried badges as deputies of the Louisiana State Police. Kathy became obsessed with all the guns. Her brother had been in the National Guard, and she knew how they were armed. She started doing the math of all the Blackwater mercenaries were carrying at least two guns each. That would mean hundreds of 9mm Heckler and Cox sidearms, hundreds of M16 rifles and M4 machine guns. She felt as if she had stumbled upon the answer to her husband's disappearance. Nothing else made sense. This seemed the most logical thing. One of those mercenaries responsible to no one had shot Zytune. Now they were covering it up. This is why she had heard nothing. The whole thing would be covered up. But there was also so many American troops. Surely... They had things under control, as well as she could surmise there were at least 20,000 National Guard troops in New Orleans, with more arriving every day, but then she thought of the guns again. If each of those soldiers had at least one M16 assault rifle, there are about 20,000 automatic rifles in the city, too many. And if Governor Blanco was right that these were vets coming straight from Afghanistan and Iraq, it could not bode well for her husband. She searched more websites, went deeper. There were 5,750 Army soldiers in the New Orleans area, almost 1,000 state police officers. Many of them there were SWAT teams armed for urban combat, 400 customs and border protection agents and officers deputized for local law enforcement. This included more than 100 men from Border Patrol tactical units, men usually armed with grenade launchers, shotguns, battering rams, and assault rifles. There were four maritime security and safety teams. The new Coast Guard tactical units that Homeland Security had formed as part of the War on Terror. Each MSST carried M16 shotguns and 45 caliber handguns. There were 500 FBI special agents and a U.S. Marshal Special Ops team and snipers. They were sending snipers into the city to shoot looters and gunmen. Kathy added it up. There were at least 28,000 guns in New Orleans. That would be the low number, counting rifles, handguns, shotguns. She couldn't look anymore. She turned off the computer and paced. She lay in bed, staring at the wall. She got up, went to the bathroom, inspecting the new swath of white hair on her head. Again, she returned to the computer in search of her husband. She was furious with him, with a stubbornness. If he had just gotten in the odyssey with them, why could he not simply surrender to the same logical hundreds of thousands of people had recognized? He had to be apart from that. He had to do more. He had to do something else. She found an email Maude had sent to one of the missing persons agencies. The picture he had attached were now the only ones she had of her husband, the only ones she had in Phoenix anyway. They had been taken a year before in Magla. They, they'd gone, the whole family, and the pictures were taken on the beach near Ahmed's house. When Kathy saw that beach, she could, think only, she could only think of the hike, the insane hike her husband had insisted they take. If ever there was a totemic memory that encompassed the man, it was that day. 
They had been in Magla for a few days when the older kids felt comfortable enough in Ahmad and Antonio's house to be left for the morning. Zaitun wanted to take Kathy and Sophia for a walk on the beach to be alone for a bit. Zachary and Nadaba and Aisha entertained with Ludafia and Layla and the pool in the backyard barely noticed when they left. Kathy and Zaitun walked down the beach, Zaitun carrying Sophia. They walked for a mile or so down the shore, the water cool and calm. Kathy was as content as she had been in years. It was almost like a real holiday, and her husband actually seemed relaxed, like a regular person on an actual vacation. To have him this way, just walking on a beach for no reason, just to feel the water between his toes, it was a sight of him she rarely saw. But it didn't last long. Almost as soon as she took notice of his sense of peace and leisure, her eyes focused on something in the distance. See that, he asked. She shook her head. She didn't want to see what he saw. That rock, see it? He had taken notice of a small rock formation in the distance. Jutting into the sea a few miles down the shore, Kathy held her breath, afraid of whatever notion was brewing in his mind. Let's walk there, he said. His face bright, his eyes alive. Kathy did not want to walk to a particular destination. She wanted to stroll. She wanted to stroll, then sit on the beach and play with her daughter, then go back to Amaz. She wanted a vacation, idleness, frivolity, even. Come on, he said. Such a nice day, and it's not so far. They walked toward the rock, and the water was pleasant, the sun gentle. But after another thirty minutes, they had gotten noticeably closer, and they had come upon a low promontory that separated one part of the beach from the next. It seemed a perfect place to turn around. Kathy suggested this, but Zaitun dismissed it out of hand. We're so close, he said. They were not so close, but she followed her husband as he climbed over the rock, holding Sophia with one hand over the jagged ridge and down again to the next stretch of beach. See, he said, when they landed on the wet sand, so close. They walked on, Zaitun transferring Sophia to his shoulders. They continued another mile, and again the beach was interrupted by a ridge. They climbed over this one, too. When they were again on level ground, the rock in the distance seemed no closer than when they'd set out. Zaitun wasn't phased. They had been walking two hours when the beach was interrupted by another, much largely promontory, this one big enough that homes and shops had been built atop it. They had to climb up a set of steps through the roads of the small town. Kathy insisted they stop for water, for ice cream. She drank her fill, but they did not pause for long. Soon he was off again and she had no choice but to follow. They jogged down the steps on the other side to continue on the beach. Zaytu never broke pace. He was barely sweating. So close, Kathy, he said, pointing to the rock in the distance, which looked no closer than before. We should turn around, she said. What's the point? No, no, Kathy, he said. We can't turn around till we touch it. And she knew that he would insist she do it, too. He always wanted his family long for his quest. Zaitun showed no signs of fatigue. He switched Sophia, now sleeping from one arm to the other, and kept going. And they walked for four hours in all, up and over three hillside towns, across 50 miles of beach, before they were finally close enough to the rock to touch it. It was nothing much to see, just a boulder jutting out into the sea. When they were finally upon it, Kathy laughed, and Zaitun laughed, too. She rolled her eyes, and he smiled at her mischievously. He knew it was absurd. Come on, Kathy, let's touch the rock, he said. They walked out to it and quickly climbed to its peak. They sat there for a few minutes, resting, watching the waves crash against the rocks below. And as ridiculous as it had seemed en route, Kathy felt good. She had married a bull-headed man, a sometimes ridiculously stubborn man. He could be exasperating in his sense of destiny. Whatever he set his mind to, even a crackpot idea of touching some random rock miles in the distance, she knew he would not rest until he had done it. It was maddening. It was strange, even. But then again, she thought it gave their marriage a certain epic scope. It was silly to think that way, she knew, but they were on a journey that did sometimes seem grand. She had grown up in a small Baton Rouge house with nine siblings, and now she and her husband had four thriving kids, had been to Spain, to Syria, could seemingly achieve any of the goals they conjured. Come on, touch it, he said again. They were sitting on it, but she hadn't yet officially touched it. Now she did. He smiled and held her hand. It's nice, right, he said. After that, it became a joke between them. Any time something seemed difficult and Kathy was ready to give up, Zaitun would say, Touch the rock, Kathy. Touch the rock. 
and they would laugh, and she would find the strength to continue, partly out of a strange sort of logic. Wasn't it more absurd to give up? Wasn't it more absurd to fail, to turn back, than to continue? Monday, September 19th. Kathy woke up having reached a new kind of peace. She felt strong and was ready to start planning. She had been paralyzed for almost two weeks now, waiting for word from her husband, but this was folly. She needed to go home to the house on Darch. She was suddenly sure that she would find her husband there. His family in Syria was right. The most dangerous thing was these roving gangs of men that made the most sense. As the city emptied out, the looting likely grew more brazen and engulfed neighborhoods like Uptown. The thieves have come to the house on Dart, and not expecting to find anyone there had killed her husband. She needed to get back to New Orleans, hire a boat of some kind, and return to the house on Dart. She needed to see him wherever he was. She needed to find him and bury him. She needed all of this to end. All morning she felt a new serenity. It was time to get serious, to stop hoping, and to start working toward whatever came next. Midday, Kathy heard that another hurricane, this one called Rita, was bearing down on New Orleans. Mayor Nagan, who had planned to reopen the city, now canceled those plans. The storm being tracked over the Gulf with winds above 150 miles per hour was expected to hit September 21st. Even if she could make it near New Orleans, the winds would push, would again push her back. Nadima came in the living room. Should we pray, she asked. Kathy almost said no, as all she did was pray, but she didn't answer. To she didn't want to disappoint her daughter. Sure, let's. And they prayed on the living floor. Afterwards, she kissed Adama's forehead and held her close. I will rely on you so much, she thought. Poor Adama, she thought. You have no idea. And then Kathy's cell phone rang. She picked it up. Hello? Is this Miss Zaitun? A voice asked. The man seemed nervous. He pronounced Zaitun wrong. Kathy's stomach dropped. She managed to say yes. I saw your husband, the man said. Kathy sat down, an image of his body floating in the filth. He's okay, the boy said. He's in prison. I'm a missionary. I was at Hunch, the prison up in St. Gabriel. He's there. He gave me your number. Kathy asked him a dozen questions in one breath. Sorry, that's all I know. I can't tell you anything else. She asked him how she could get a hold of Zaitun if he was being well cared for. Look, I can't talk to you anymore. I could get in trouble. He's okay. He's in there. That's it. I've got to go. And he hung up.